Revelation 6. Turn there. You know you're going to be there anyway. You're going to like it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where we're going. Revelation 6. This is going to be a good one. Verse 12, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Now, everything has a purpose. Everything has an order established by God. God is a God of order. Um, he tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, and that's the, that is the chapter that teaches on tongues and he says let all things be done decently and in order so God is a God of order and he does everything this way this way this way this way did it did he have to take six days to create the world no but he did it and he did it for a reason and every day of that creation is a day that God has an order in the number of the day. And I could spend all day talking to you about that, but I won't. But the, the number six here is going to play into the meaning of the number six. The reason, this is the, there is a reason why this is the sixth seal. And why this event is happening in relation to the sixth seal. Um, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Even as the fig tree casteth her untimely figs. When she is shaken up a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as the scroll. When it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth. And the great men. And the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And we've seen other scriptures where that's been laid out and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. I mean, can you imagine this? The, the terror of God being so terrible that people would rather be trapped in a cave than to face God. That ought to tell you something. It is, a, it is to be a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is something to be reverenced, it is not a party. You are in the presence of what the Bible calls God calls God terrible. Well, that doesn't mean bad. It means it's like the Israelites at Mount Sinai. When God himself comes to the top of the mountain, it terrorized them. It scared them so bad. They said, let not him speak. They couldn't even withstand the voice of God. It terrorized them so bad. So here this event happens and people are so scared out of their minds. And let me just side, let me chase this rabbit for a minute. Here we are living in a world where there is absolutely no more shame that goes along with sin. Um, where was I? I, pulled, I was getting, I was at the gas station yesterday morning getting my morning pop. And a woman walked in and she had a, two teenage girls following her in. They all got out of the same car. And they looked to be about 13 years old, and here they were holding hands going in. Now, 50 years ago, that was innocent. Today, you know what it is. 
the way they were dressed, the way they appeared, just different things about them told you this. When we were, hang on, David, when we were in Colorado um, at this amusement park, um, I saw probably half a dozen teenage lesbian couples, teenagers, hanging all over each other. And I'm just, there is no shame anymore. Uh, we was in Taco Bell one night and a lady brought in, I guess her son and his boyfriend, young teenagers, sitting over in, the, in Taco Bell waiting for mom to bring their food and them holding hands and smiling. At, and I'm just like, I'm out of here. David? What? Oh yeah, that's that's going to happen. There's no doubt. There's no doubt that's going to happen. Um, yeah. Minor attracted, a map. A minor attracted person. Um, that's coming. Um, but the legalization of drugs, not just marijuana. But you go to, where is it, Oregon? They just basically legalized all drugs. Whatever drug you want, you get. And there's no more shame associated with sin. However, it is now a shame to be a law enforcement officer. It's a shame for you to be a parent and refer to your children as this is my son and this is my daughter shame on you for that you're demanding gender you're imposing gender on them when they should be allowed to pick their own gender and, uh, and the bible's right that the time has come when wrong is right and right is wrong but what's going to happen here is the world is going to see what you and I believe. That when God reveals himself to this world, there is going to be an instantaneous terror on the earth insomuch, the Bible says, men's hearts will fail them for fear. They will go into the caves and beg the rocks to fall down on them and hide them from the face of the Lamb. And I'm, they, just people, you can't stop what's going on in this world. You can't. But God has a plan for it. Trust Him. He's got a plan for it. It's going to bring about His glory. It is. Okay? Trust him always. So the great day of his wrath is coming. Who shall be able to stand? Now, this issue, back up in um, verse 13. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Again, we go to Revelation 12, which we won't. But there, one third of the stars are cast down to the earth. Um... Other places mentioning the stars of heaven falling to the earth, Matthew 24, I believe, and other places are referencing that event. Now, Ecclesiastes tells us the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. The Apostle Paul tells us, and this is part of how I'm going to begin the message this morning. The Apostle Paul tells us all these things are written aforetime, are written for our admonition and our learning. In other words, read your Bible and read it, number one, as a history book, because it is, but also read it as a, a sure word of prophecy. Every story 
every event, every historical thing. What did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. He's telling you that things that happened prior to the flood, during the flood, those things are going to happen again. So now, let's, let's do this very quickly. Go to, uh, go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, and we have two things created on day 6. If you look at verse 4, God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, cattle. What did the Israelites make in the wilderness? calf and that was their God wasn't it so understand that the earthly creatures are types and shadows of heavenly creatures then he said creeping thing a snake is a creeping thing have people worshipped Serpent gods throughout the centuries. Yes. Quetzalcoatl. The, there's a, a pyramid down in um, a place called Chichen Itza, Mexico. I thought it was chicken pizza. Chichen Itza. And it's, a, it's one of these perfectly built pyramids because... It's a pyramid built to honor and worship the serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. He was a feathered serpent. And I won't get into all of it, but that's what it was built for. They worshipped the dragon. They worshipped dragons. They worshipped serpents, creeping things. And beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. So those things created on day six. Beasts. What did John see coming up out of the sea? A beast. And that beast had a number. What was that number? Six hundred, three score, and six. Three sco a score is twenty. So three times twenty is sixty. Six hundred and sixty and six. So that number six is going to be related to the man of sin, son of perdition, the beast, and so on and so on. And then... In verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And here's to what's interesting to me is that in the beginning, God gives man dominion over the beast. But in the book of Revelation, God gives the beast dominion over man. It's upside down now. Okay? So, now turn to Genesis 6. Because this is what I believe is related to that sixth seal. And what happened in Genesis 6. Remember, these things that you see in the Bible that happened aforetime are going to happen again. In Genesis 6, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Sons of God, indisputably, in my mind, are angels of the angelic realm. Um, it's that way in the book of Job. Job chapter 1, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before God. Satan came also among them. Gen uh, Job chapter 2, the same thing. There was a day when the sons of God came and Satan came among them. Sons of God are angels. Over in Job 38, 
He, God asked Job, where was thou when the sons of God... Um, See, how does it go? When the sons of God uh, sang forth um, and all the host of heaven shouted or something like that. The host of heaven are the angels. The sons of God then are the angels. In Psalm 82, God said through David, I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the most high. Gods with a little g are of the angelic realm, and Psalm 82 says that they were the children of the Most High. So all through the Old Testament, sons of God are angels. In the New Testament, here's what I like, it's different. All through the New Testament, every place you find sons of God, it's us. We're sons of God. We're the sons of God. It doth not appear what we shall be. But we are designated as literally sons. Of, it's, it's like a child. It's like a, a couple announcing that they're going to have a baby. And the father says, she's going to have my child. I hope it's a boy. He'll be my son. He'll be a son of Mike. Okay. Well, I said that three times in a row and it didn't happen. So finally we tried one more time and got a son of Mike. So even though we couldn't see what Matthew looked like in the womb, we, after a while we knew he was our son, that he was my son. He had the title of the son of Mike. He was a hoggard already. But it wasn't known what he was until he was born. And then we could see him face to face. And now we know he's in his form now. This is what he's going to look like. Okay? So that's the way it is with us. Right now we are titled as the sons of God. But it does not appear yet how we shall be. But we know that we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is, the Bible says. Now here's what's interesting. Just as God kicked out and expelled the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and all of those other nations that were in the promised land and expelled them and then put his people in their place. Canaan land is a picture of heaven. So God does the same thing. He expels a third of the angels out of heaven. Guess who gets to take their place now as sons of God? We do. Um, when the question came up about, you know, the, uh, the man marrying a wife and he died, left no seed. Then his brother had to take over and he died. And his, then his brother had took over and he died and they had seven brothers and no child. Who's, whose wife is she going to be in heaven? Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For they shall be as the angels in heaven. We will, we will be as the angels in heaven. So that's, that's what I believe. So these sons of God mated with the daughters of men. Now some say that the sons of God were the righteous uh, seed of Seth. Because in the days of Seth, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And the daughters of men were the unrighteous daughters of Cain. Even though it doesn't say that anywhere. I mean, it does not say that. It does not imply that. It does not even elude to it. That doesn't answer the question. How did these... How is it that when lost... When saved men marry lost women, does that mean they're going to have giants as babies? Doesn't answer the question. Sterling Glory, do you remember when Max, uh, Max Palmer came here to this church? Big, tall guy, uh, seven foot nine, seven foot eleven inches tall, something like that. Remember that? And his four foot eight wife, uh, no joke. No kidding. He was 
huge. But he had problems. He had just had to have knee surgery. And he couldn't hardly get around because his knees could not hold up the weight that was sitting on top of it. Robert Wadlow, the Alton giant, tallest man on current, you know, modern record. He was still growing, by the way. He died 23 years old, something like that. Worked for Brown Shoe Company. They sent him all over the place, you know, to be a shoe salesman because Brown Shoe made him this shoe that was about this big. And so they would have a big day where they would pay him to go from town to town and sell brown shoes. Anyway, Robert Wadlow was just a quarter inch away from being 10 feet tall. And you would say, boy, he'd be good at basketball. He wasn't. He couldn't hardly run. He, his, his body ratio was just, it was off. He was not an athlete. And it got to where he had to have a brace around his ankles to help him hold the weight up from his body. And one of the braces wasn't fitted right and it rubbed into his leg and caused a wound and it got gangrened and that's what killed him. He would have been still growing had it not been for that. So just because there were giants in the earth in those days. They, were t they weren't just tall people. They were huge people. They were men who not only were, according to the Bible, in excess of 13 and a half feet tall. That's Og. Uh, his bed stand was... Uh, nine cubits, I believe. Um, so not only was he probably as tall as 13 and a half, maybe 14 feet tall, he had a girth about him that sustained the size of his body. He had a strength about him that you wouldn't want to mess with him. Most of these, most of these giants, wherever they were, they were in charge. They were kings. So when the, um, when the 12 spies go into the promised land and they see the children of Anak there, the sons of the giant, and they say there are giants everywhere in this land, we're not going in there. They were serious. These men were, they were a terror to mankind. There are stories Story, story, uh, all of the ancient Native American and First Nations in Canada and all and down in South America, they all have stories of these giants and how these giants were bad people, murderous people, cannibals in many cases. Um, so. Yeah, if you want to believe that the sons of God were the righteous lineage of Seth and the, and the daughters of men were the wicked children of Cain, that's your business. But it doesn't answer the question of where these giants came from because it specifically says in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in into the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became Mighty men, which were of old men of renown. The Greeks had the Titans. Um, the Romans had, the, I don't remember the Roman term for it, but they had their version of it. And you have, you have every civilization on the earth having stories of men, in some cases, some of the stories bear out, maybe some of these men were as tall as 30, 35, 40 feet in height. And again, that's not just a stretched out skeleton. That is someone who has the bodily mass and the girth to uphold the massive size that they were. You know, elephants don't have little skinny bones like us. 
Elephants have great big bones to hold up the weight that they have to carry around all day long. Okay? And that's how I believe these people were built. But here's my point in this. We know. Turn to uh, Daniel. Daniel chapter 2. Yeah. Daniel chapter 2. We have the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but he doesn't remember the dream. And the dream troubles him. He calls together his magicians and so on, astrologers, sorcerers, asks them, tell me what the dream was. And they said, well, well, we can't do that. You tell us what the dream was. We'll tell you what it meant. And he said, nope, sorry, I don't remember the dream. If you don't tell me the dream, then I'll know that you've been lying all these years and you have no idea what you're doing if you cannot tell me my dream and I'm going to kill every one of you. Well, Daniel got with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, listen, guys, we're going to be hanging tomorrow if we don't pray and ask God to give us the interpretation, to give us this dream and the interpretation. Well, they prayed that night, the next morning, Daniel goes, I know what it is. He goes in before the king and he lays it out to the king. King, you had a vision and here's the vision. There was a head of gold. It was this image. It had a head of gold. It had a chest of silver. It had uh, a, a, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron and the feet were of part iron and part clay. And Nebuchadnezzar says, that's it. That was the dream. Good job. Now tell me what it means. And then Daniel commenced to telling him, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. You are a king of kings, a king of kings. And then he goes on down to describe the silver and the brass. And, and notice that it's going down in value. Gold first, then silver, then bronze, and then iron. And then after the iron, you just have dirt. Okay? So... But here's what, here's how he described the mingling of the iron and the, and the clay. He says in verse 40, verse 40, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of part, potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now I'm going to stop right here. We have four parts to this image. Whenever you have that, you are talking about something in the spiritual realm and something either related to the true gospel or related to the false gospel. In this case, it is related to the spiritual realm and the false gospel. The spiritual realm consists of principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what I believe is the meaning behind these, especially this fourth kingdom. Fourth kingdom. Because these devils that you and I fight, and, and again, I probably will end up preaching that too this morning. These devils that you and I fight and are wrestling against. Listen, the problem with this nation is not the government. The problem with this nation is that we have allowed so much sinfulness. Like I said a while ago, there's no shame in this country anymore. And we are literally a breeding ground of every foul and unclean spirit that there is. The problem with America is a spiritual problem. Amen? And... If the spiritual problem is taken care of, 
the physical problem of this world will be taken care of. God swears it. He promises that. So this is what that fourth kingdom is. They are, it is a kingdom of devils, spirits. Notice what they do then in verse 43. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, that fourth kingdom, shall mingle themselves. Clay is mankind. That's what we're made of. That's what we consist of, clay. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That is exactly what happened in Revelation chapter 6, both before the flood and after the flood. Before the flood, a group of angels came down and created the giants by mingling with human women. God destroyed the earth. Afterward, it happened again. Another group of angels came, married human women, created these giants. We have Anak, we have Ar, we have Og. Um, boy, there's just name after name after name of the giants in the Bible. We have all these kings who were giants in the Bible. And then slowly but surely, they start dying out until you have a few left. You have five who belong to one family, Goliath and his four brothers. Well, what happened to all of them? They all got killed, didn't they? Sterling says that's why David picked up five stones, because Goliath had four brothers. Okay, maybe so. He passes them out to his brothers. Hey, boys, you'll need this. What for? Try, watch me. Well, that's how you get rid of them then. So anyway. But it obviously happened after the flood. God allowing it to be so. I believe on a mass scale, this event will take place again for the last time. These spirits will mingle themselves with the seed of mankind, literally his DNA. The promise that the devil gave Eve in the Garden of Eden plays into this. You shall be, if you eat of this apple you, or this fruit, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And man is attempting to climb higher and higher and ascend himself, both with knowledge and understanding and esoteric wisdom. He wants his mind open, his third eye open, so he can attain enlightenment. This is every religion in the world except Bible Christianity. With Bible Christianity, our enlightenment comes through the Holy Spirit and from the Word of God. Somebody say amen. No rituals. We don't have to tie ourselves up in yoga knots in order to get this. All we have to do is read our Bible, pray, and say, God, show me what this means. And God said, I'll show you what it means. I'll answer your questions. Okay? So I think the sixes are related. You have in Genesis 6, the event of the sons of God and the daughters of men. By the way, Goliath, six cubits tall. His brothers had six fingers and six toes. The number six plays into this. Uh, the sixth seal and the stars of heaven are going to fall to the earth. What I think is going to happen then is that they're going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. Then after that, you have the beast coming and his number is 603 score and six. And the Bible says it's the number of a beast and the number of a man. And both of them were created on day six of creation. So that number, and I've got more notes on this, but we'll, maybe I'll write another book on it. You can read it. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for uh, opening our eyes. We thank you, God, Lord. It's as simple as reading this Bible, asking you, Father, for help, asking you, God, for understanding. You said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless your word today in the hearts of these people, Lord, that they would understand. And Father, it may, may not even seem relevant today, but give us understanding, Lord, that one of these days, this event, according to your word, this is going to happen. 
And Lord, it is part of the false gospel. It's not something, Lord, that we want anything to do with. We already believe that we will be taken up, caught up into glory to be with you like the angels are forever and ever. And we're given that not by the things we do, but by your grace alone. Help us, Father, to trust you, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen.